I'm Kevin Hirschner, and you're watching an excerpt from Scenes and Songs, the show that dissects outstanding movie and music pairings. Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas was released on September 19, 1990. The film, which centers around lower-tier associates of an Italian-American mafia organization, was a moderate commercial success and warmly embraced by critics at the time of its release, a reception that has only grown in stature over the last three decades. At the 63rd Academy Awards, Goodfellas was nominated for Best Picture, while Scorsese received his third nomination for Best Director and his first nomination for Best Writing, a nomination he shared with his co-writer, journalist and author Nicholas Pileggi. After specializing in crime reporting for over 30 years, Pileggi wrote the non-fiction book, Wise Guy, Life in a Mafia Family, which would serve as the source material for the film. At the time of the book's release in 1986, Scorsese had already made several crime dramas and was not interested in revisiting the subject matter. But after reading the book, Scorsese was so impressed by the book's attention to detail, he personally called the author to tell him, I've been waiting for this book my entire life. Pelleggi's response? I've been waiting for this phone call my entire life. Scorsese felt it was only right that Pelleggi and he co-write the screenplay, and the two felt an immediate kinship. Both were raised in Italian-American families in New York City, and while neither of them were ever involved in the Mafia, they each felt they had lived significant portions of their lives adjacent to organized crime. Their thorough research and wealth of experience would be utilized while translating the story of real-life criminal Henry Hill to the silver screen. The film documents 25 years of Hill's roller coaster life, from his beginnings as a preteen errand boy for the local mafia capo in 1955 through his gradual rise in the criminal underworld, which ultimately leads to an involvement in the most lucrative cash robbery in American history before becoming an FBI informant in 1980. Although stories of crime are virtually as old as cinema itself, Goodfellas sets itself apart from other mob films for two reasons. One, the story focuses on mid-level gangsters rather than the top of the mafia chain of command, and two, Scorsese indulges in the highly detailed day-to-day -day minutia of what it is like to be a gangster rather than the actual crimes. We learn the intricacies of making a proper spaghetti sauce experience, the power that comes with a crisp shirt collar, and meet characters who disappear the moment they are introduced. Yet not one single frame of the infamous $6 million Lufthansa ice is even depicted on screen. This slice-of-life approach to a film genre that has so often been romanticized on screen served to suck the audience into Henry's lavish life of temptations before it spits us out through Henry's tumultuous, cocaine-induced, paranoia-filled finale. True to the docu-style presentation of this classic rise and fall story, the film does not contain a single trace of original score. Instead, the character's exploits are soundtracked by ever-present period-appropriate music. As the character and time period change, the music choices keep pace right alongside. Henry's youthful optimism during the late 50s and early 60s is represented by doo and Motown music. His dive into the depths of debauchery in the 70s are mirrored by aggressive blues-inspired classic rock. And Henry's final song as he accepts his tragic suburban fate and prepares to enter the 80s is a punk rock take on a classic standard. Not only did Scorsese go to great pains in order to ensure his music selections were always period appropriate, but he also insisted that each song would obliquely comment on either the characters or the scene. This approach is most effectively on display at the end of the film's second act. Henry's cohort has successfully pulled off the heist of a lifetime, and Henry has obtained more wealth and power than he ever dreamed was possible. But what Henry doesn't know is that this is the beginning of the end for his life as a wise guy, as one member of his crew begins murdering the others one by one. This montage of murder and mayhem, which carries us into Henry's third and final act, could only be scored by one song the wistful, instrumental coda of one of the most iconic pieces of music in the history of classic rock. Thanks for watching this excerpt from Scenes and Songs. For full episodes, check us out on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever podcasts are sold.